The Short Fuse podcasts are conversations with artists, writers, musicians, and others whose art reveals our communities through their lens and stirs us to seek change. I'm Elizabeth Howard, the producer and host of the Short Fuse podcast. We've recently introduced reading groups designed to reflect the creative process of the author. Each one is unique. In this first series, we're talking with Gay Wally, the author of the Venus as She Ages collection, six novels. Thank you for joining us. You can learn more about the Short Fuse and our reading groups at shortfusepodcast.com. Thank you. Gay, what a pleasure reading your books with you. Your books have, have received awards both nationally and internationally. The Erotic Fire of the Unattainable was a finalist for the Paris Book Festival, and it was made an, in, into a film under the direction of Frank Vitale. It's streaming on Amazon. I encourage people to watch it. Margaret Dahl reviewed the book in the New York Times book review. She described the father in the novel as the sardonic, blunt-spoken, appealingly appalling father who makes his daughter his comrade in arms. Gerald likes to take long drives to get away from whatever woman he's married to at the moment, dragging little Charlie out of school in Montreal to the back roads of Vermont or the seaside towns of Gloucester, Massachusetts, he won't stay for more than two drinks in any bar. There are many bars. You write lovingly of the alcoholic father, how difficult it is to leave the emotional terrain we came from, to run fast only to find that we have a certain loyalty to it and to easily arrive back there. I mean, the, the thing about the alcoholic father or that kind of a father. It's a sort of a love object you can never really have, but it is her love object. Uh, she doesn't have a mother. And um, one of the themes of the book is really that she's always longing. She's in love with longing and, and, in, and sort of going towards that search. I think it, the book ends with her saying it's a, it's, a, it's a journey that would never end. One of the premises of the book is that it's sort of like a, um, you know, it's sort of this dark night of the soul that's always pulling you. And so it, it can be manifested through different men. It can be manifested through art. It can be manifested through anything. But it sort of sets up her own alco almost alcoholic, although not, not with alcohol, but a sort of dreaminess of longing. And the father has his own longing, too, that she sort of inculcates. His is more for just lack of reality. Let me read from a passage from the book. I often think that the truth was that my father sold me at a card game. He was losing. Indeed, he lost everything. The men are all sitting around the bar, and this card game is a secret, all-consuming vice of my father's. He will do anything to keep in the game. And he says, okay, I've got nothing except my daughter. When she's 18, you can have her. You can take her and do whatever the hell you like. The nameless man, fortunately, he's rather attractive and Clark Gablish about the whole thing, puffs on his cigar, pulls on his white ruffled shirt sleeves. His hands are immaculate. My father, on the other hand, has cigarette holes all over his clothes, but the wonderful arrogance of not needing to try. Both men have hairy wrists. Rhett Butler contemplates this barter slowly and then graciously accepts. My father loses me. There's never any doubt about that. Brett Butler lets me grow up, keeps distant tabs on me. He's got his own mistresses anyway. And he has inf informants update him on, on my anguishes, passions, mistakes, separations, repetitions. And then when I've got it down, when I've reached a stage of some balance and turned into a woman who could possibly care for someone, I am no longer strangled by caring for myself. When I'm, in other words, in the balance, he comes up one day casually at a street corner. He hasn't aged a bit in these 25 years and says, well, you know, you belong to me. Your father sold you to me in a card game. There is, of course, the ethical question of fulfilling an ancient contract. 
And then there is a tributary of runaway possibilities, the refusal to go back. But I regret to say feelings of nostalgia flooded daily and lo- loudly over me, and I lose some diligence. I factor in the Rhett Butler impatient kind to me, although I am well aware that he could have maimed my father without the surety, and so out of some strange deference to my father or laziness, some closing of the circle, I think okay, and go off into this man's world of danger, indifference, and incredible possessiveness. Sometimes I stay there, and I can see that the whole thing is ghastly. I am trapped again, and that I tear myself apart and aside to run, run fast. I must always, though, keep a part of me, that part hidden. I suppose the story puts everything in a child's language, big symbols in strong black letters, because let's face it, my own isn't that different. There just wasn't a card game. So how how did you think about writing this book? It was my first book. The theme for the book at the time when I conceived it was I wanted to show how romantic but not sexual relationship with the father and a kind of living in a sort of world of unreality together, but sort of lo- and loving each other would affect the marriage later on. How she has grown up in unreality is... Um, trying to be, you know, a normal person, but really knows nothing about it and how, how that affects her later when she has to actually be without the, in the book, the father dies. She has to function in the real world and what happens then. So, so how did you draw the characters? How, how did you? You mean, how did I come up with who they are? Yes. I mean, some of it is my own, you know, inner geography in the sense of, she grows up in Montreal. I myself had a British father. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of it was sort of, I used kind of the tools around me and then I just let it go. At the time I was sort of thinking about this whole thing of loving somebody flawed. If you, if you start off loving someone really flawed, you're going to keep going towards people that are really flawed. And so I was wrestling with that in myself. So my little pen went to paper. Reading this book, I, I thought of Shuggy Bain you know, that won the Booker last year, which of course is also about Douglas Stewart's love of his, uh, great love of his alcoholic mother. It is certainly different having an alcoholic parent. Well, um, an alcoholic parent lives in Never Never Land. Mm-hmm. And so, and a child is dependent on that never, never land. So what's going to happen when they have to deal with reality? I mean, I think there's a line in the book where she calls her father, she's an adult, and she says, she's, she's asking him about love. And he says, you sound drunk to me. And she's, she's already separated from him. And, he, and she says, well, why wouldn't I have grown up around drunks? I mean, what else, what other sound would I have? It's really about how to, what do you keep from Never Never Land and what do you let go of from Never Never Land? Because some of it is poetic, you know, they're by the ocean, they're, they're, it, there's an illusion of freedom. You're not playing by the rules, do you know what I mean? So it's seductive as well as, just, it's seductive and destructive. Well, so as a child to sit, which you did, to, to be at a bar as a young child, to be dancing on a bar as a young child is, is an experience that a lot of us don't have or haven't had. I wouldn't recommend it as a child rearing technique, but, um, uh, but, it's, but it's what it is. I, I remember when, um, when it came out, the first edition, long, long time ago, I, I went to some kind of book thing where that you talked about it. And I guess a psychiatrist said, well, any child that would grow up in a bar would be watching other people all the time, which is true. What else is a child going to do in a bar? And so, um, and that would naturally tend to being writer. It doesn't escape me that we've grown suspicious of ourselves. We polish ourselves down, rub out the jagged edges, the unformed, the unsure, the ugly, in search of a smooth, pleasing, puritanical line. But are we also dishonest? Do we suspect so much evil, we grown-ups, that we must not stop for a minute from our careful scrutiny in case the messy, 
perhaps artful self goes wild. Even our wildnesses are prescribed carefully for us. Perhaps the unfinished intuitive self might lead us to a messy, laughing path of rich tangles. Entanglements need courage. We won't crack up for our fingerprints. A thousand lashes, not for our stutters, but for our proud self-judgments. In other words, keep a wild card. As far as I can see, wild cards in their surprises silence us, and only then can we stumble upon the sea flow of ourselves. Mm-hmm. So much of our self-monitoring, it seems, um, may not root to ourselves, but it might be the surprise, the unexpected, taking us back to, to encounter ourselves. Yeah. What's interesting about these Venus books, and I, is Murphy on? I saw that she was on. Uh, oh, there she is. Murphy, uh, Murphy Lewis, who's on this call, is in Paris. She's up at 12.30 in the morning. And, um, and she put these books together. There's a sort of theme throughout all six of being an outlier. In a way, I mean, I never saw these six books together, but Murphy did. But in a way, she starts off being raised as an outlier. and using different, if you want to keep the metaphor, cards. And then what happens along as she tries to come in, tries to can't come in, you know, all these. I think that the whole desire for freedom Mm -hmm. is a huge theme. It's it's crippled in the father, but the young woman gets to act it out, find a way to find her own freedom that is not crippled. With, with a lot of things going against. Murphy, could you talk to us a little bit about, about these books and as person who published them, looking at this as the first? It was always one of my favorite books just because we were, at the time I was being edited by Gay on one of my books. And so it was a very interesting book for me because of the juxtaposition of the father and the boyfriend, you know, that there's this constant pull between the two and her trying to figure out how to love. And yet in the end, kind of loving the same kind of man, like Gay had said in the very beginning. I think also I was interested in a woman who was trying to um, find her way at all cost and not give up who who she is. Like all through the books, I feel that's what is happening for the protagonist, that she is constantly, you know, kind of moving herself through the world and always in that want of love and longing, like Gay had mentioned earlier, but there's this theme of, of, I'm not going to give up myself no matter what. You know, there's this running... And I think that's why I made it like Venus as she ages. Of course, that line is in one of her books. It's not like I created it. It was from her book. But that it it seemed the most important because there is actually this person developing and growing and picking up steam. And we have this problem, I think, in our culture of finding the me center or, you know, the, the core of the self. And there is this running theme of a core all the way through of of the women inside these books. So for me, that was very important. How did others reading this, how how have you responded? We have other questions Mm -hmm. or comments. Well, I see one here from Therese. I agree with one of the book's critics that it is not plot-driven, but emotion-driven. But that's its charm. What do you think unites the two scenarios? Well, I think that they're both, they both love her and and she loves them. And um, I think that, but both are, um, what's the word I want, handcuffed by their own inability to really know how to function in the real world. So it's a different struggle with the boyfriend than it is with the father. But Somewhere she made, the girl made a, the father is constantly telling her, you know, you can't trust anyone. You're going to be alone. She's sort of raised to be on her own forever. And the boyfriend husband has to deal with that, that she's got to drive to fulfill that. 
And it's a, in the case of this book, she honors her father's, you could say curse, mm-hmm. but, but also it's a romance, the curse that is a romance. Mm-hmm. Um, this is from Catherine. How does this book tell the story of creativity as the character searches for herself? Is it a metaphor for the search for the story or the, for the search for art? Well, okay, that's a very interesting question. I, the, the girl, and I, I would have to say that this, this part of her character is really primary almost in all the book. The one thing she trusts is art. And, and the one thing that she, and work, and independence, the one thing that is pure to her is art. So in a way, she's untouchable to all the things around her. She retreats into that. And it's, it's like a fuel for her. It's a fuel that makes you keep going and keep on growing and keep on discovering. It's all she has, really. She bets on it. 100%, 150%. And she's willing to go down with it. Yeah. I think that's true. In, I think that's true in all the books. Well, you talk, Gay, though, about the work, which people who know you know that it, it's, and in chapter 18, you talk about, I must work. I work night and day. My father used to say, the thing is you can't trust anyone. I had no mm-hmm. idea that it would keep me quite this busy, quite this solitary, and this faith in work. Even I am suspect. It seems work is the way I leave Harry Hope's bar, O'Neill's hopeless hope, all this faith in work. So love does not disappoint me. So is it love or is it art? I mean, it's work or art. Art is work. Yeah, that's how she leaves Harry Hope's bar. bar. That's the only thing she trusts, you know? And I think she goes into relationships. Now we're moving sort of along other... Mm -hmm. Things. But each relationship is really for her to learn and to, to process. And even with a boyfriend, husband, and strings attached, she's growing all the time. She's, she won't get hemmed in. She just won't. She wants to keep learning. And, she, and, and I, I think in strings attached, she doesn't really, she's not really an artist later that she is, but she is trying to be in a normal world, working and taking care of herself. And she's, she's discovered that there is, that's where the same base is. And someone's asked, what does the title Strings Attached mean to you? What it meant to me is that, that no matter what happened, she was, the father had laid these strings, even though he dies, she's attached to him. That, that it's a long string. The romance of pulling her all the time away from a, norm, a so-called normal life and yet towards feelings of love because she does love him. So it's, it's a string in a way that's constantly around. Anna, could you talk a little bit about what you mean? First of all, I'd like to, to provide a personal context and then... I have not read fiction for a very long time because all I've been doing is reading technical things. So I love fiction, but it's been a while. (laughs) And I've been trained as a psychoanalyst. So I used medical lens as I was reading this and I felt slowed down because I I have to make comments and underline. (laughs) And, And I found that at first I thought, oh, what a, Sorry, person. Then I, as you read what she does, is that ultimately um, there's not the presence of the mother, and that at some point that has to affect her psyche. But she has the loving attention of her father, no matter how you see um, whether the love is dysfunctional or not. But she has the attachment, she has the adoration, even though he dismisses her. He has. Um, a presence in her mind so that every relationship that she goes into, she's going to find men who are obsessed with her in some way or another, and that she's going to be one who demolishes the mother, Fayusa, so that she doesn't have to um, compete in the same way uh, because she's attracted to certain kind of men who they seem to 
to follow into that uh, obsessive quality that she yearns for. And so it's not even love, it's it's the obsession <laughs> that is something, and even in work, you know, because that can be obsessive as well. So that that's where I find the energies for her. Does, does that make sense? And, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and Brenda, you call back. You you said Charlie seems to have so little going for you. So she has some resilience. Maybe you could respond to Anna, as I said. Oh no, I think that's um, that's great, and I think that she's such a remarkable character. That young child, she just really. She's amazing to who she is and how she develops out of this background from her bar stool. She, she, she comes forth and it was, and yet both her father and her mother are so, although I do agree totally with what she was saying, I think her father loves her the best that he can, which isn't always very good. And so I was just wondering, like, you know, do you think, how does she get like this? She's got neither parent is giving is really parenting her in a very good way and yet she seems to be able to she gets on that bus by herself and goes to the airport to meet her father I mean and she's just always somehow able to draw on her own stuff to take care of both both Peter and her father so it was just amazing to me that she could be that strong and I was wondering Gay, if you had any sense of you know do you think it's is it born in her <laughs> or how, where does she get it? Is it because out of necessity that she's, that she has to make it on her own, that she ends up being this way? Yeah, I think it is necessity. And I think she was love, as you say, I think, I mean, I think it's much harder when you're not loved at all, or you're loved in a way where you're, uh, you have to be what somebody else wants or whatever. I mean, from the beginning, she's sort of on her own, like she'll leave a bar and get into it. You know, I mean, he's sort of not interested in the details of raising somebody. <laughs> so she has to kind of think how to do this stuff herself. I think it's necessity. Otherwise, she's going to die. But it's an interesting question, Brenna, because, and I hadn't really thought about it. I don't use, and the way that Anna's using it, the romance with the father, the Oedipal situation is fuel for her to keep going in a certain way. It's kind of a drama she's in. Mm-hmm. And so she, it, it empowers her not to stop. It becomes what she's running, f- and that's kind of what I was trying to say with Elizabeth. It's what she's running from, but often is running toward. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the tragedy of the book. But also her indomitableness is the opposite of the tragedy. Therese, would you like to add, you had a question about perspective and writing, perhaps even from the male perspective, perhaps you can ask Gay your question. Well, I just can't remember at any point, having known Gay's writing for a long time, (laughs) never written from a male perspective. And I wonder, um, well, not really why, but what the challenge would be. Actually, I have written from a male perspective. And also, I think in prison sex, I am in the perspective of the prisoner and the husband. This one is pretty female dominated, as is the next one. I mean, as a playwright, you obviously have had to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have written as as a man. These particular six books have been sort of, I think, selected for the woman's journey. Are there other writers or books that you read that inspired? I know we're we're going to talk about a couple um, in one of the books, but who are the writers that perhaps that you were thinking about when you were writing this book? Great question. I don't frankly remember, but um, Peter Miller's on here and he wrote me recently and said, oh, the book is kind of French. I liked Charlie, grew up in Montreal. I did read a lot of French writers, and I think I was influenced by them. And that's the sort of emotional journey that Therese was talking about versus the plot-driven journey. Mm-hmm. But the, the emotional journey is as interesting, or for me, it is maybe more interesting mm-hmm. than the mm-hmm. plot-driven journey. 
What writers at the time? I don't think so. I, I can't remember who. Someone's asked, uh, one of the things I noticed is rarely using the names of men. Was this a literary device or is it a tool to make the men disappear into the background? You mean I don't call the father, well, the father I call daddy, Daryl sometimes. I don't recall a lot of other men in the book. <laughs> Maybe there are, I hope not. No, it wasn't a literary device. If it is, it was unconscious. Let me read. The wound wasn't the way she loved him or the way he loved her set off in unhealthy atmospheres. The sad, gaping wound, the one that forced her smiles, the wound was the failures of love. Where could she, where could she have given more? That was the wound that fl- froze her. Yeah, that's after he dies. You talk about... Okay, the fact that it's perhaps better to love than to be beloved. This goes back to Brenna's comment. I mean, I think the reason that she survives, such as she does, is because she did have that love of him. And that that was the activity, the, the emotion. There's a lot of motion in it. She's moving, she's doing, you know, in the ocean, of course, plays a part. I think she's sustained by the loving of him. And that she has a she has, in my opinion, she has a desire for purity. She's an idealist in a funny way. And so she's after love and knows that she has to love. She just doesn't really know how to. That makes any sense. Mm. When did you start the second book in the series? So did you did you have a thought when you finished this book that you would take a woman through the cycle of her life through? No, not, not at all. That was, I, I didn't have any thoughts about that. I was always interested in different styles and different ways of telling a story. So like the next one has a completely different style and voice, a little stronger, really less elegiac. Strings attached is a bit soft, but of course the books reflect issues that I was thinking about as I grew older. That's the whole Venus as she ages things. The writer's aging as she's writing and writing about the issues that happen as you age, so to speak. So the next one is really, in 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 this particular series, is about a fear of getting married Mm. and the tricks of that and why and the tricks she plays around that. Gay or Murphy, who had the idea of of kind of putting these books together? I asked Gay during the COVID, send me whatever anybody hasn't published. Uh, Because I kind of made this joke, Gay, what's the most successful thing we've ever done together? And we decided it was erotic fire and that it had become a film. And so I just said, send me whatever you don't have published. And I just sat down all summer, kind of that first year of the COVID and read it. And I just went, like maybe like August or September, I was like, gay, it's, it's one book. It's one theme. It's one whole story going on. And she was like, what? And I said, well, it's Venus as she ages. So it was like, it just, it wasn't a plan. We didn't plan it. It was more out of kind of going back and reading it and relaxing in the, in her words. So um, they were in my drawer. And in fact, I had to have Therese read them <laughs> to um, say, you know, did this really be seen? The other funny part about it, they were never written as a series or anything, but Venus, I mentioned Venus in every book, which was mm-hmm. kind of weird. Yeah, it was unconscious. Mm-hmm. Therese, did you see the style? I mean, had you thought about them together as you were reading? Because you've known Gay and her work. Well, there is a unity of voice really overpowers you after a while and control of dialogue gets stronger and stronger. So uh, it's been a wonderful experience. We had a blast together. So I wanted to read as we get near that the sea town reminds me of my father's geography. And even now working with men and interacting with them as an oddity, as the one with feelings and expressions for them, I am again returned to my father's map as the one who is different, as the one who is artsy, as the one who is wondering, 
as the one without the power except her charm, as the one looking for their approval, as the one not having a home for her madness. When I am guilty, when I feel Peter's lostness, my own, I go back to Peter, to the sea town for my father. It is time I leave him to his story and begin my own. Oh, that's about sums it up. Would you write more ever about your father? Would you go into more? Anna mentioned that, you know, it's Oedipal. I'm not sure anymore. I think I wrote this in my late 30s. And I, I, I then believed everything was sort of nurture. Now I believe most things are nature. So I, um, uh, I, I'm not wrestling in the same place. I'm not in the parental drama anymore. I got, I got other fish to fry. Mm. But interestingly enough, the early books, you know, one of the things about going through them again, that this one and the next one, it's very different, the next one. And whereas this one is kind of soft, the next one has a lot of anger in, at herself. and it's. But after, I, it burnt me out on the parental drama. So I, I don't have a desire to, to return. To. So help us, Gay, think about reading the next book. Is there anything you'd like to say about that? Okay, Murphy, do you want to say something before I say something? It's to any lengths is the next yeah. I think the title really tells you that she would go to any lengths. There's this, you know, go to any lengths to kind of find herself, go to any lengths for love. And, and you're right, Gay, it is probably the most angry, but I, I would say it's more that she's really working something out. She's really making a decision about what is she going to do with this man that's been in her life for so long, and, and there's this other pull that's drawing her with a prisoner. I think it's a really important, I think book two and three are the big turning points of, of the protagonist. You know, if you want to follow the protagonist as the same, you know, almost like a series, that's how I would see it. Although it's not a series and it is very much individually written. But still, I feel like there's this draw that's running her and two and three are just like, whoa, you know, or or even four, but two and three really are just really pushing herself through something to come to the other side. But I like the style of two. It's a bit jazzy, too. Yeah, it has a jazz quality to it. It's very free. I play around a lot. Did you feel after you finished that a, a sort of catharsis? Uh, is oh, which you, one? Uh, the, the, the second one. The second one. No, I didn't feel any catharsis. That one had a different theme. I, I was interested in crimes of love. She has a friend who goes to jail for marijuana growing, but which makes her start to think about what's what's prison, you know, and that gets her thinking: what are crimes? She, so, she begins to look at her own crimes. And that led me to thinking, what are the crimes in her life? And what was the crimes done to her, but what are the crimes she has done? But it's done in a kind of a jazz way. There's more strength in her in, in this second one. It's kind of tough. It's kind of, she's also ruthless about herself. It shows that, you know, as they say, people have been hurt, hurt others. So David has asked this great question. If we look at your books as a series, which one, if, if not a singular piece of advice or wisdom, would the young Venus impart to an older Venus? So what would the young Venus impart? By the way, I'm not the Venus. But the um, impart to the older. I think the strings woman, girl, woman, has a certain poetic innocence about her. She keeps, the ocean is inside her. Her father's wound and, and love are inside her. And what she has to tell older one is to keep going for love, to keep going for, to keep growing, to keep, keep finding what's real. She, she's always on the move to find to get free, to find herself. I'm going to read the last paragraph of the book. She was alone and focused, driven wild inside, rushing as she went ruthlessly, blindly, eternally toward what she loved. She didn't know it in words, but it was a journey she would make forever the rest of her life. 
there was no ending to it. This is when she's on a bus going to meet her father at the airport. Mm-hmm. So, Gay, will you tell us uh, what you're working on now? Are, are, are you working on anything as um, you're always writing? So are, are you working on something? Yeah, I'm working on a, a novel that I, I wrote during COVID, which is a very different novel for me because there's a happy ending. Actually, this novel was a um, wish fulfillment thing for me. I, in this novel, I did everything I want. Everything happened to me that I'd like to happen to me. So uh, I just went with it. But actually, I had the most fun writing. it. It's very pleasurable to me. My so-called character starts over again. And uh, she falls in love and, oh, you know, many good things happen. Any other questions or comments? There's a wonderful series of podcasts that Murphy and Gay have done on, on the website so that you might want to listen to those. I just want to say one thing that I was really struck by your, the dad's, the death when he was dying and that that scene was so poignant and um, just really beautiful. And the bond, I, I don't know, it was just so him going to a, a motel to die, didn't want to, you know, I mean, I don't know, the whole, her, just how she handled it. And I don't know, it was one of my favorite parts. Yeah, it's, it's actually my favorite part of the book. Well, thank you all for participating in this. Yes, thank you for coming. And we're meeting again on May 24th. Same time, and we'll be reading to any lengths.